The Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court takes on the question of confidence in the courts. We cannot respond to politics. We can't change our decisions. We can't rule one way or another way because somebody wants us to. We go one-on-one -on -one with Nathan Hecht. His perspective on campaign contributions for judges and the high-profile abortion case before his court. We need somebody who's going to be stand up and fighting for our community, and so we want to take our fight from the House to the, to the Senate. A big battle in Big D puts two Democrats in a primary election fight. I think we can do a lot better than for uh, one member to go after an effective member. We look closer at a race that will push one liberal lawmaker out of the legislature. Produced from the Capitol in Austin and airing statewide, this is the award-winning State of Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Ryan Chandler, in for Josh Hinkle. As Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, Nathan Hecht has played a role in some of the biggest stories in Texas politics this year. He was on the stage on Inauguration Day, in the Senate chamber to begin Ken Paxton's historic impeachment trial, and on the bench for some of the most contentious cases in the country. So as he nears the end of his influential career, I had the opportunity to sit down with the Chief Justice to reflect on what his tenure has meant for Texas, but also to look forward to how we can improve justice for all and how politics influences that justice, including, of course, the crucial abortion case still pending before his court. Mr. Chief Justice, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Absolutely, thank you for asking me. You know, you look around these chambers at all of these former justices on the wall, but you are the longest serving of them all, more than three decades of service and jurisprudence on the Texas Supreme Court, but it seems like this next year may be your last when you surpass the mandatory retirement age for state judges. What more would you like to accomplish to finish your career strong? Well, we're coming out of a very difficult time with the pandemic, but we're looking for new ways to make our system more effective. Um, for example, an easy one is we never heard of remote proceedings, basically. I mean, telephone calls every once in a while. Uh, before the pandemic, now they're standard fare in a lot of uh, uh, our proceedings, but they don't work in others. And so we're trying to figure out when do they help people, when do they work better, when do they not. And that whole um, shift in mentality is making us think, again, we've thought about it before, uh, how can we do our jobs, how can we process the cases that come to us in ways that make it easier on the parties, the lawyers, the public, um, so that the experience they have in sometimes difficult cases is a good one. Mm. I want to ask you about the effect that COVID had on the judiciary system. You said in your State of the Judiciary Address back in April that we could learn some positive changes out of the tragedy that was COVID, but you, you recognize that there are still a lot of issues with accessibility um, when it comes to especially Texans of limited means and children accessing uh, the court system. What more do we need to do in order to make the, the justice system uh, applicable and accessible and fair to every Texan, no matter their means? Well, we need to do lots. Um, we, the judiciary, uh, not just in Texas, but as an institution has not been customer service related um, oriented. Sometimes I say that if the court system were a business, we'd, go, we'd be bankrupt because we just don't uh, tend to our, the needs of the people who have to come and see us as much as we should. So um, we're looking at all kinds of things. Um, we have uh, been very supportive uh, of funding for access to justice for the poor in Texas. Um, the legislature had, has been very supportive over the years. It's not a partisan issue in Texas. Um, uh, both sides uh, have been very supportive, worked for it, for veterans, victims of domestic violence, and um, just the poor who have difficulty getting their problems resolved in court. Uh, we're experimenting with kiosks so that uh, uh, make it even yet easier for uh, a person who needs legal counsel to get it without having to go somewhere. 
having to go downtown or to some office, or certainly not the courthouse, where they have to get take off work, get childcare, um, drive places they don't usually go, and then sit there, and then when they get there, sit around and wait uh, until the system can get to them. So we're trying to streamline all of that and look at our whole docketing processes. Um, this is especially true, for example, in high volume family courts where we can try to figure out ways um, that uh, to reduce waiting times for people who are there for usually many times short hearings. Uh, all of those kinds of things to just make the system work more efficiently so that yeah. if it were a business, and it's not, it's a justice system, but if it were, um, we would be responding to the needs of the people that are coming to us. So much of our legal system is based on centuries and centuries of precedent, right. but the 21st century may help it a little bit as well. So <laughs> right. working to bring it into the, the Zoom age. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you compared the court to a business um, because th there has been uh, a lot of effort this year in order to cater more uh, to all of the businesses that are coming to Texas. Um, you advocated for specialty business courts in order to streamline some complex commercial litigation. Uh, the, the legislature ended up approving that idea. Throughout the legislative process, though, um, when uh, le legislators were, were pushing to create these new specialty courts, there was some concern about what that could mean. Uh, some critics r raised the idea that this could amount to special treatment of um, powerful businesses and right. give the governor too much influence over the judges he appoints to these courts, for example. What do you make of, of the critics and, and why do you believe these courts will, will help Texans? Well, first of all, um, I appreciate the criticisms because they give us um, an opportunity to respond. Uh, we can't uh, dust off these uh, legitimate concerns about how the system's going to operate. Um, but this is not brand new. Other states have uh, had similar uh, kinds of dockets and procedures. Um, and the idea itself uh, is very familiar to Texas. We already have specialty courts. We, uh, the family courts in uh, the urban areas are all specialty courts. That's all they handle. Some of the family courts only handle particular kinds of family cases. On the civil side, again, uh, there, uh, from time to time there has been a, a division of dockets in civil courts so that judges who feel like they're better at doing a particular kind of case or it works better just to have those cases in court um, can do that. On the criminal side, we already have felonies and misdemeanors. We have drug courts. We have veterans courts. Uh, we are trying to use um, legitimate differences in cases and dockets to move things along so that uh, people will feel like uh, the justice system is responsive. For the business courts, um, we want the business courts to, uh, to be fair, and they're going to be, um, but to be perceived uh, to be fair. Mm -hmm. um, the criticism that business is special, um, I think is answered by these cases will involve most of the time businesses on both sides. Uh, and so it's just a way of making sure that the complexities of those cases uh, get addressed and that, just to take an example, if you've got a simple car wreck case and you're just trying to get it tried, uh, you're not sitting there behind uh, two big businesses duking it out over huge issues. And by the same token, if you're that case, you're not sitting behind the simple car wreck case mm -hmm. waiting for two days or however long it takes uh, for the jury to come back with a verdict. So it's, it's just a way of um, structuring the dockets so that they're more efficient. You alluded to the perception of fairness there. Yeah. That is also a challenge, it seems, the judicial branch uh, nationwide is facing. The Texas Politics Project found last year that 26% of registered voters in Texas 
have a favorable view of the Texas court system. What do judges like you need to do in order to convince more Texans that the judicial branch is fair and reliable? We need to make it work better. So here's what we can't do. We cannot respond to politics. We can't change our decisions. We can't rule one way or another way because somebody wants us to or somebody doesn't want us to. Uh, all of that is off limits. The independent judiciary has got to call it like it sees it. And that's where a lot of the criticism is coming from. What the media uh, portrays um, and what the people hear is that, oh, well, there was this decision. And what do you think of that? Well, I think that's terrible. Oh, and then there was this decision. Well, that was terrible too. Uh, and so the, you come away with a kind of a negative uh, feeling about the court system. Whereas uh, when people know, for example, uh, that courts in Texas uh, are working very hard to make sure that people with mental health issues in a case uh, are accommodated. So that's in the criminal system a lot. We have diversion programs to try to help uh, treat people who are not acting out of um, criminal intent so much as medical mm. issues. Uh, guardianships, family cases, children cases. When it, um, is it say, here's what the court system is doing. Uh, we've done surveys nationally and people say, oh, well, you tell me that. Uh, I didn't know that, that that's, that's great. When we tell people uh, how successful our veterans courts have been, mm. uh, everybody is, well, you know, that's a really good thing to do, but not everybody knows about that. So I think one of the things we're gonna do um, is try to uh, increase those initiatives uh, to be sure that the uh, courts appear to be to the public legitimately mm -hmm. responsive to their concerns about justice, not about uh, anything political, just about justice. And then to do a better job of talking to you about it, of, of trying to make sure that the people know. Yeah. Many of the issues you just mentioned are nonpartisan, at least in Texas, right. they, they garner support from both parties. They are at least bipartisan. Uh, it, it is hard to separate from politics when um, the justices on the Supreme Court are associated with parties, and it's, it's not even five to four or six to three, it is, it is nine to zero dominated by the Republican Party. In fact, Texas is one of only eight states that elects judges in a partisan election. It, do you think that's the best way to do it, or, or should Texas move away from partisan judicial elections? Well, I'm on the record for 50 years saying it's a terrible system. Um, I uh, uh, told the New York Times the other day that I thought it was terrible, and they said, could they print that? And I said, sure, and they did. So, <laughs> but it's no secret. I, I think it's an awful system. I understand accountability. I understand that uh, judges need to um, be accountable to the people, but uh, elections don't make that happen. Mm. Um, people get a ballot particularly in big counties, but uh, even sometimes in a little county. They get a ballot, there's all these names uh, of judges. People don't know who those judges are. They don't know whether they're doing a good job or a bad job. Uh, and so the accountability part of the justification for doing it um, is, is diminished. Meanwhile, yes, uh, the politics, particularly in this day and age, is, um, is terrible. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the commentary on the courts, on our court, uh, is always, well, um, there's eight Republicans there. Well, um, it, uh, almost all the judges, I think all the judges in Harris County are Democrats, Dallas County are Democrats, Travis mm -hmm. County. Um, but uh, it, the people have chosen that We've tried to talk them out of it. We've said this is terrible. Uh, look at other states. When they elect judges, it gets very political. Mm -hmm. We really don't want to go down that road. But uh, if you say, uh, give me your right to vote, they're going to say, no, right. we, we don't want to do that. Do you think it's even practical to fully separate politics from the judiciary? Because, I mean, if you 
replace it with an appointment system, say, by the, by the governor or legislators, those are partisans appointing right. presumably their, their favored parties as well. So how do you push past politics in a way that is, that is more pure? The, the way that I think is essential is that you've just got the culture of the judiciary just has to be divorced from the political system. And the mindset of the judge, the judge's character, the approach to the bench, all has to be uh, completely out of politics. As you say, that's very hard. And when judges are running for office on partisan ballots, uh, they have to go back to the courtroom and hear cases and not pay any attention at all to whether uh, a party was supportive of their election or a lawyer. Uh, you have to divorce all of that. And um, I think both in the appointed systems uh, and the elected systems, uh, you can uh, build that culture of um, and strict adherence to the rule of law, divorcing those kinds of considerations uh, in the judiciary. So it involves constant training. Uh, we're constantly training our judges uh, and um, trying to make them see, help them see uh, how important that is. Yeah. How do you do that personally? I mean, it's no secret you're a conservative, lifelong Republican, correct? Um, but when you put the robe on and um, try to weigh the facts of a case, how do you make sure that you divorce yourself from politics and try to follow the rule of law? Well, I've been elected seven times to statewide office in Texas, uh, which is a record for, I think, our court, maybe across the board. But um, you, uh, in, in my own uh, view of the job, it, you just... Uh, that's over here and that and this is over there and I've never been very political in a partisan sense mm -hmm. um, and so it's not so hard for me to kind of uh, think of myself as more independent but mm -hmm. you have uh, judges have to do this all the time and um, the public doesn't always appreciate appreciate this but you have to ask yourself every day um, is that fair? Is that really fair? Mm. Uh, did you really uh, consider nothing but the law and the facts? I mean, you have to kind of hold yourself to a reevaluation um, and never get into um, the idea of thinking, I'm the judge, I call it, and that's the way it is. Yeah. Uh, so, and working um, it, it, for me, it's. Uh, helpful to work with the uh, political branches, the uh, governor's office and the legislature, uh, and both sides of the, uh, uh, of the aisle in the legislature, both Republicans and Democratic uh, representatives and senators, uh, and uh, present myself to them as, um, as a judge. Mm -hmm. And this is what the judiciary needs. And uh, they're going to tell me the truth. If they, if they don't think I'm doing that, uh, they're not going to wink and nod. They're going to say, oh, Judge, I'm not sure. Uh, so I th it, we, it's just a constant training discipline to mm -hmm. do that. I, I want to ask you one more thing about the optics of the court, uh, especially in the U.S. Supreme Court. They have come under fire recently uh, from critics questioning the ethics of some justices. They, they've just adopted a, a code of ethics, if you will, right. following pressure from some gifts, donations, and, and favors from wealthy and powerful donors and interests to, to some justices, of course, Clarence Thomas in particular. Do you think the U.S. Supreme Court needs to get a better grasp on their, their optics and, and their ethics when they interact with these wealthy interests? Well, uh, I think I'm not going to tell them what to do, uh, and certainly <laughs> I'm not going to tell them what to do when I come from a state and my position is dependent upon not just contributions, but contributions to me uh, as, a, as an mm -hmm. office holder. Um, and we're all very, all the judges uh, that have to campaign for office are worried constantly that that 
aspect of running for office, the contributions, just looks terrible. Mm -hmm. And we've done polls on this, and people think, oh, yeah, that, that looks terrible, all right. Uh, and the judges themselves, when you ask them, they say, uh, it looks terrible. Now, uh, again, as I just said, I hope we have the discipline to not let it uh, matter to us. But we do, we have to worry about the optics and we have to worry about uh, what, you know, how does it look? Um, I think the U.S. Supreme Court's adoption of an ethics code um, is uh, a, a, a reasonable and um, a responsible step uh, toward uh, the, to, in, re, in response to the criticism that, that they've gotten. Um, and uh, I think uh, criti the criticism will, is going to continue, uh, whether it's uh, because of some uh, trip or, uh, or something like that, uh, or whether it's the decision that you signed off on. Uh, and I think uh, by having the code, they can respond to it and say, we're uh, adhering to a code. Um, so I think they've, um, uh, I'm very glad they did what they did. I'm glad you brought up how this works in Texas because, you know, let's say a plaintiff puts a briefcase of cash in your office and says, thank you for ruling this way. That would be bribery. <laughs> but, no. but right. a lawyer could donate thousands to your campaign and then show up the next day and argue in front of you in this chamber. Yep, absolutely. It's Why? horrible. I, I mean, I've said it's horrible for 50 years. And we, back in the early 90s, Tom Phillips and I pioneered in uh, limits on campaign contributions. Well, the mm -hmm. first time I ran uh, back in 1988 for this court, uh, there were no limits. Uh, a, a contributor could, the sky was the limit. He could give you as much as he, as he wanted. Um, we said, oh no, you can't give uh, more than $5,000 per person, which seems like a lot in a two million dollar race it's not really uh kept law firms the legislature came in behind us um and uh enacted all of those caps as law and they've been the law ever since and it helps a little bit um, because you can say well we we do have limits on how much people can give but um it's it's just a very troublesome uh, side effect of Texas way of selecting judges. Yeah. One of the issues that has politicized the court more than anything in recent memory is, of course, abortion. Mm -hmm. One with the, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, but y you have also dealt with some of these issues in the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, just last week, I covered the hearing uh, led by 20 women in Texas. Many of them almost died from serious pregnancy complications because they argue Texas's abortion ban does not give doctors the ability to intervene even when in their best medical judgment they believe it's necessary for the mother's life. I understand you may not be able to get into some of the specifics of, of these pending cases, but if you could share what you can, what was going through your mind when, when you're thinking about uh, the, the challenge to Texas's abortion ban right now? I can't say much about it because, as you say, the case is pending, and I wouldn't want anything I said to be taken as an indication of what I think about the case or what my colleagues think. Um, but I, I, can say, I can say very readily that one thing that's going through, uh, I think, all of our minds, certainly through my mind, uh, as I'm sitting here um, listening to the arguments and knowing the stories of the plaintiffs who have filed the suit, that, that not argued so much here, but in, in the district court, um, you're thinking to yourself, uh, I want to do everything possible to make sure that you as a, a reporter, as the people that were sitting here in the room, the people who are watching on the webcast, come away thinking, uh, well, that was fair. Uh, however it comes out, um, that was fair. Uh, and then when the decision does come out, I do hope there'll be some re recollection of that and thinking they listened. Um, it's not a political decision for them. Uh, it's a legal decision. Uh, and they uh, have to decide cases all the time. 
uh, that are difficult. We just want it to be, sh we want to not ever do anything that makes it look like um, somebody didn't get a fair shake. The state here is arguing that um, the, the women in the Zorowski lawsuit do not have uh, standing because this is an issue that in a way no longer affects them because they're not pregnant or don't plan to be in the future. Can you elaborate on how that issue or that argument struck you? No, I really can't. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, so it's an important argument in the case. It's a kind of a technical argument, it seems like, to some people. Uh, and as I think you could tell from the questions from the bench during the case, um, there's everybody appreciates that there are different sides to it, even though it is a kind of a technical mm -hmm. legal argument. Um, but I, I can't tell you my own thoughts. I, fair enough. Um, one, one more political issue, and then um, mm -hmm. just want to cover a couple more topics with you. Um, you. You've been over at the legislature more often <laughs> than, than previous sessions. Um, notably, you oversaw a historic moment uh, in the Texas Senate when you swore in Lieutenant Governor Patrick to take on uh, a, a role somewhat like yours in, in presiding over the impeachment trial of uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton. Um, I'm, I'm sure you were following those proceedings. What did you make of the legislative branch's attempt um, at acting in a quasi-judicial manner in, in uh, weighing the arguments in this case? Well, that's their responsibility under the Constitution. Um, uh, the the uh, U.S. Congress has it as well. Um, and they're uh, supposed to do what they did when they think it's justified. Um, so I think it's um, because they hardly ever do it. Uh, I think it's um, kind of, uh, it doesn't seem to fit right uh, when you're just, uh, 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 just a lay person watching it. I mean, what does it mean to have uh, a trial of uh, 31 senators uh, sitting around at desks. I mean, it's just different from what you think of as opposed to a courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it struck, uh, I think that would strike people uh, as unusual, just as it did in the impeachment proceedings uh, in the Congress. Um, but um, when they think they have to do it, they have to do what the Constitution says. Do you think they did a good job administering fair and impartial justice? I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I think yes. I, no, I think they worked very hard at it. Uh, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I go over there quite a bit on judicial business. Um, and it's not like uh, this room, which is pretty solemn and quiet and mm -hmm. orderly. And over there, there's more moving around. Um, but I thought uh, I was struck by how devoted, how, how dedicated everybody was to making sure they were there, they were uh, watching, they were participating, they were uh, doing their best. All right. Um, you know, lastly, we mentioned earlier that you are the longest serving Supreme Court justice in Texas history. Um, but Next year should be your last because there was an election just last month with 14 propositions on the ballot. Only one of them failed, mm -hmm. and it was the one that would have raised the mandatory retirement age for state judges from 75 to 79. A lot of people saw that um, as an attempt to keep you around for a little while longer. Uh, what did you make when you saw the, the election returns uh, come back and, and see that one being the only one that failed? Uh, I had nothing to do with the amendment. Um, I didn't know about it, even though I was going over the legislature pretty often until it passed the mm -hmm. House, and I'm still not sure where it came from. Um, but I, uh, I don't know if, if it, I know several other judges who are going to leave office because it, the age is not raised. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, uh, some years ago, I did some re research into why we have the age limit in the first place. Um, and it was a legitimate response to a uh, concern that um, some people, when they uh, enter public office, stay longer than they should. You said, well, the people should vote them out. Well, maybe so, but sometimes it doesn't work that yeah. way. And um, uh, so I, 
I didn't take a offense to it. Um, uh, my wife said she was going to vote against it, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, she said enough's enough. And uh, we have uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing uh, my work and continuing to uh, help the judiciary very much to help access to justice for the yeah. poor. Uh, so uh, I, it does it doesn't hurt my feelings. All right. Age is certainly a hot button issue nationally in the era of Joe Biden and Donald Trump. A lot of people argue that once you hit a certain age, you're just not as sharp as you used to be and you, you shouldn't be in these positions of power. Do you feel capable and, and, and ready and able to, to continue this job if you could? I do. Um, but, you know, I, other people should judge that. Um, and I think, um, fortunately, I have colleagues who would come to me and say, uh, you know, um, maybe you should think about something else, uh, which has not happened. Uh, but um, uh, I, I understand the people's uh, concern about that. It comes up uh, from time to time. Um, uh, law firms have uh, retirement policies. Lots of times uh, they just ignore them and let the lawyer, if he's, if he's he or she, is able uh, mm -hmm. to continue practicing. So um, that's not really an option in the judiciary. And I think importantly, if you have worked very hard, uh, as I've tried to do, um, and try to make a difference, uh, you'll keep doing that, whether um, your name's on the door upstairs or not. You intend to stay in public service in, in some way, shape. What are your plans for retirement, I should ask? I don't have any definite plans. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the best course is to uh, do the best I can do uh, through the end of next year. But, um, but I do plan to uh, continue on the administrative work I've done, to continue to build the court system to make it better, to make the perception of it better, um, to make sure that uh, we respond to concerns that it's not diverse enough uh, and that um, we are actively trying to make uh, the, ju the court system and the bar uh, uh, look to the people, be to the people the uh, handlers of the justice system that they want. So that involves a lot of those uh, kinds of things. I know uh, diversity has become a very political word mm -hmm. recently, um, but it doesn't, just making it political doesn't do away with the issue uh, and doesn't do away with the responsibility of those of us who administer the system to make sure that it looks fair mm -hmm. to everybody. So continue with that work. And, uh, the National Center for State Courts has had for years um, a what they call a blueprint for racial justice um, mm. that I've been uh, uh, part of the leadership of, uh, and that's we're, we're again we're trying to stay out of politics, but we but we take the point mm -hmm. of people who say uh, you should worry about um, making sure. Uh, if you can't use the word um, diversity, making sure that it's fair and uh, making sure that people feel like that the composition of the judiciary, the composition of the bar, uh, the recruitment, the, the opportunities for advancement, the way we treat people in the courtroom, all of that is fair. Do you think the diversity of the bench around Texas is sufficient now? No, it's not. Mm. What, do, what do we need to do to change that? Well, it's a... It's a problem that the bar has struggled with for a long time, uh, and it's just hard um, for various different reasons. Uh, it's been studied lots and lots uh, to uh, recruit um, people that uh, whose uh, ethnicity is underrepresented in, in, underrepresented in the bar. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you have the choice to go to law school or not, but sometimes that choice doesn't look realistic. Uh, to people, and you need to find out why. Um, and uh, the the uh, nature of the judiciary in Texas is cha is changing, uh, and the voters get to decide. 
Um, but you, uh, you still have to be mindful of uh, the overall fairness um, and, um, uh, and, the, the, and the confidence that the people have that it's being fair. Yeah. Well, last question for you, sir. After 35 years on this court and a long time leading it, what is the legacy that you leave Texas? Well, uh, things have um, changed a lot. We've worked on a lot of programs um, that we have used to make um, the system run better, more efficiently. Uh, we're still not there, but uh, we worked on that. Um, and to appear um, responsive to people. So we've done it, Mental Health, Children's Commission, uh, with um, criminal justice reform, juvenile justice reform, uh, court efficiency, kind of across the board, not cases and not decisions, but just making sure that the system um, runs uh, more to the liking of the people that it serves. And um, I, I hope that uh, uh, I leave a legacy that uh, justice is crucial to our society uh, and the courts are there to uphold and protect it. Mr. Chief Justice, thank you so much for your time. You bet, thank you. Thank you. A battle on the ballot will push one Democrat out of the Texas legislature. An in-depth look at this tense primary fight. And Republicans in one county decided to change how they count the votes. Why that's bringing a search for more election workers. Texas voters will make some big decisions in the coming weeks that could shape the future of the state. Election day in the Texas primary is just over two months away and the presidential race is of course at the top of the ticket for both parties, but there's not likely to be much drama there. The Texas Politics Project at the University of Texas polled voters to get their thoughts on the candidates. And our Will Dupree spoke with Jim Henson, the executive director of the Texas Politics Project, to take a deeper dive into the results. Regarding the presidential election, though, it looks very likely that Donald Trump and Joe Biden will have a rematch in the presidential election. Uh, where do voters stand in their preferences at this point? Well, you know, I mean, I think if you look at the two steps in that right now, Donald Trump is dominating views of the Republican primary. 65% say that they will vote for Trump right now with, you know, much lower amounts for everyone else, DeSantis 12, Haley 9. But then in the, in the direct head-to-head -head between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden right now, Trump best Biden 45 to 39, hmm. remarkably close at this point to what the result was in, in 2020 in Texas. And you all put head-to-head -head matchups with Joe Biden against some of the other leading Republicans, and that also showed some interesting numbers come out of that too. Yeah, I mean, Trump is doing better than everyone else against Biden. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is that you show, we showed a very close race within a point or two between Nikki Haley and Joe Biden. Yeah. And now look, if you're a Nikki Haley fan, it's like, see, she's a contender. But ultimately, I think, you know, the, there were a lot of people that went somewhere else, a lot of Republican voters, that, that Nikki Haley pushed into the undecided or someone, you know, unnamed someone else category. Mm -hmm. And I think it underlines the degree to which, you know, the market for Nikki Haley, if you will, has been a little bit inflated so far. The campaign for U.S. Senate is the biggest primary race on the ballot for Texas Democrats. The winner of that will face Republican Ted Cruz in November. And the latest poll from the UT's Texas Politics Project shows Congressman Colin Allred with a 21-point lead. State Senator Roland Gutierrez is the next closest candidate in the crowded field, but almost half of Democrats polled say they haven't made up their minds yet. Democrats in the Dallas area face an interesting choice in the primary. Dallas Representative Victoria Niave Criado will challenge incumbent Senator Nathan Johnson. Both are respected members of the legislature and our Monica Madden spoke with both of them about what's at stake in this primary battle. We have fought tooth and nail in the House to kill bad legislation that's disproportionately impacting our communities. Dallas Representative Victoria Niave Criado planning to give up her safe House seat to go for the Senate. We need somebody who's going to be stand up and fighting for our community. And so we want to take our fight from the House to the 
to the Senate. But in that endeavor, she's taking on fellow Democratic Senator Nathan Johnson rather than challenging a neighboring Dallas Republican. I will be a different type of senator and will and will work hard and to to pass good legislation at the same time stand up for the values that are important to our district. Niave Criado says Johnson has not done enough to thwart what she views as bad legislation from the majority party. The fact is he doesn't feel that sense of urgency, but people from our community do feel that concern. There is a we have to stand up to fight when there is so much at risk. Johnson says he welcomes the competition. No one's entitled to a seat. I'm not entitled. She's not entitled. But as the minority party thinks Democrats need to focus their energy on taking Republican seats. But if we're concentrating our resources on getting better government, you know, democratic values, that kind of thing, I think we can do a lot better than for uh, one member to go after an effective member. As Democrats, we need to be having this debate and discussion. Are we going to be, uh, you know, are we comfortable with the status quo? Are we comfortable with business as usual? Johnson rejects her assertion that he has been ineffective. If you're going to get something done in that environment, you've got to work with the people who are there. It doesn't mean you bow down to them, but you absolutely, you can't win without a majority. And I do pass bills. Reminding his voters of bipartisan wins that he has accomplished. Whether you're helping people with something like Medicaid expansion, education funding, or the fundamental infrastructural things like water and electricity, I'm working on those big issues. A Senate showdown with early voting set to start in February. Monica Madden, State of Texas. It's nuts to do a hand counted ballot election. One Texas county makes a big change when it comes to handling elections. Why they decided to count votes the old fashioned way next year. Texas voters will head to the polls in just over three months for the primary election and Republicans in one county decided to change how they count those votes. The party wants to do that counts by hand and our Will Dupree explains what led to that change and why election experts say it is not a smart move. Republican voters living in Gillespie County, where Fredericksburg is located, will have their votes counted by hand, not machines, during the March 5th primary. If you hand count ballots, you take away the chance that anybody has manipulated with the programming of the machines. The county's party chairman, Bruce Campbell, says this concern all stems from Donald Trump's loss in 2020. Even though we did not have any evidence of that happening in our own county, People wondered how could you protect against it in advance. This time, hand counting the primary results will require the party to hire and train nearly 250 election workers. And the party expects to spend at least $12,000 to do that. It's nuts to do a hand counted ballot election. Election expert Robert Stein says this invites more human error that could alter vote counts. And they get challenged in court largely because each time you count a hand ballot without a machine by hand, you're likely to come up with slightly different results. Party leaders say they'd like to have everything counted in four hours, but their fellow Republican elections administrator Jim Riley says respectfully that may be pushing it. It's going to take longer than they imagine. I do believe they'll run into more glitches they, than they expect. Will Dupree, State of Texas. While Gillespie County Republicans continue to look for election workers, Democrats are contracting with the county to have their results counted by machine. So the elections administrator expects those results to be shared fairly quickly on election night. Travis County Republicans also pushed for the ability to hand count their party's primary ballots. The party negotiated a deal with the county that includes having the option to hand count Republican votes. They're still working out whether they have the resources for a hand count. The party can also now get more information from the county clerk on who voted where. Party leaders said they believe the moves will improve election integrity. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Ryan Chandler. We'll be back next week and next year to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.